it was a very challenging environment to say this, but I'm not going to steal your thunder here. Jan, everybody in this room wants to know a little bit about your journey at Eskom, a journey that came to an end in July 23, and you are now the chairperson of a renewable energy play, Mulila. Mulila, yeah. So let's just go back, if I can, take you perhaps to a darker place. My marriage. <laughs> Sorry, Vagi. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bronwyn, uh, and, and really thank you for the opportunity. Um, I was very blessed. My, my dad used to have 25 years for Eskom. So I grew up in an Eskom house, so to speak it wasn't an Eskom house, but uh, I grew up in an Eskom house. I was an Eskom bursar. Of course, sitting there, we were at university together. Then I did um, my national service, so I studied engineering. Um, did national service, and I think Kohi is here as well. There he is. We did national service together. Um, and then I started with Eskom um, for 26 years. Um, so my first life in Eskom was 26 years. I was really blessed. I worked throughout the value chain, um, distribution, transmission, generation, and then a bit of research, test, and development. And when I left Eskom after the 26 years, um, I was responsible for the group Capital building Madupi and Kusile and Ingula. So, and then also, perhaps I can mention that I was also blessed to have been given the responsibility for electrification in the mid-90s. So, because of some reasons, one of it uh, I couldn't except the decisions that were, were made in 2008, which Eskom is still paying for now in terms of Kusili and Madupi. I decided to leave Eskom. So for 10 years, I was on my own. Being a contractor, worked in, in Africa, etc. But I think the, the important thing is I learned what life is all about outside Eskom and how important is a bottom line and how important people, how important they are. Then I got the call from the Eskom board in 2008, 2018, sorry, to come back as a group chief operating officer. And Lindy will tell you, it took me about five weeks to make up my mind. And what they told me during the interview, or what I can expect in Eskom, but it wasn't even a fifth, or even a tenth of what I experienced when I, when I walked back. It was a different company. I grew up in Eska, worked 26 years for and my dad used 25 and me 26, and we walked back into an organization that is foreign, completely foreign. Um, significant challenges, uh, really. So, but so be it, you know. Um, we tried our best um, to, to see how we can ensure energy security in the country. Um, and, 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 you know, I suppose we will talk about uh, my view of the challenges in ESCOM, but because of the challenges, significant challenges in the organization, it was difficult to, to make a, a quick stride forward. Um, and then, obviously, when we were there, uh, myself, let's talk about myself. Uh, it was very quickly for me to, to identify that the big issue that we have is no maintenance have been done. Now, if you have a, a, an old car, that's, I started using the, the example of an old car. If you've got an old car, 15, 20 years old, and the only thing you do is you put in fuel, you pump the tires, you put in water and the radiator, and when you get in the car, the foot is on the accelerator, all right? So you get whatever you can out of it. And then the best of all is, let's assume, and please, I have nothing against any car maker. If, if you drive a Mercedes or whatever, that's and whatever the case may be, and if that's what you have and some, somehow it breaks down and you need to take it in, you don't take it to a Mercedes dealership. You take it to anybody. When you have somebody working at it, and thanks to black economic empowerment policies, nothing wrong with the policy, but the outcome nobody understood. Uh, and then when you have somebody working in your car, it's not a, 
a qualified Mercedes mechanic as anybody. And when you put in spare parts, not Mercedes spare parts, at any part. And you know from which country I, I actually mean. So that's what I found when I got back. Um, significant, significant challenges. And if you take a power station, is designed to run for about 50 years. And if you take Madupi and Kusili out of the equation, um, on average, the power plant, the 12 power plant, cold fire power plant that is left is in excess of 44 years old. Abused, not maintained. So this is what I found when I got back into ESCOM. And then, geez, I walk in there and the only thing on my table is voluntary separation packages. I said, but uh, I don't understand it. No, we've got to transform. So I said, I understand transformation and I fully support transformation. But again, if you don't understand the successful outcome of transformation, and there's nothing wrong with that, and it's about numbers, you've lost it. So these were the things that I found when I arrived there. Was broken by the time you got in the second time? No, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one of the, the five issues that I've identified in ESCOM that is significant is criminality and corruption. It is, it was, and I believe it still is a free for all. Um, people, lots of people, and outside and within ESCOM, it is not about 61 million people of the country. It's not about their lives and the economy of the country. It's about their own pockets. So the rule of law was a significant challenge that we had to deal with. And, you know, if you stand on a water pipe and my wife can, can bear me out, they will do whatever they can to get you off that pipe. That's why I had nine forensic investigations in the time that I was there, uh, which I couldn't find anything. Um, so it, it, it was a difficult situation. Nine forensic investigations did you see for your life? I sound like Annika Larson. Yeah, she phoned me after Andre's uh, interview and wanted my story as well. But somehow I had sense. Um, a lot of people ask me if you read Andre's book. I said no, and I'm, 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 I'm dead serious. Why do I need to read something that I was part of? Um, the day that Andre was poisoned, he phoned me. He said, Jan, where are you? I don't know where I was. I, was. I wasn't at the office, and he said, I think I've been poisoned. So I said, w about what? what do you think it is? He said, I can only think it's coffee. Yet the office. It's because I got nauseous, et cetera, after I had coffee. And even myself had a lot of coffee. Um, but to come back to your point. Well, no, wait. That will, I... <laughs> he phoned you and he said he'd been poisoned by the coffee. He believed so. Yeah. And then what? He said to me, be very, very careful, because he was aware of all the death threats and other threats that I have received, um, you know, in my tenure at ESCOM. One of it specifically was, was most bad, you know, our oldest son is autistic, he's 31 years old, turning nearly 32 now, and that the guy that um, gave the threat said, you've got an autistic son, this is how old he is, this is what he drives, this is the time he leaves your house. All these sort of things, your middle son does, yes, yes, yes. So we strongly recommend you stop investigating. So these things that happened. Did I worry about my life? Um, no, I was very blessed. I had three personal security friends that looked after me. Um, you know, wherever I went, uh, whatever, wherever I had to to go to, you know, they were making sure that everything was fine. So I never felt threatened at all. Um, and then, you know, obviously I, I'm a Christian and I believe in God and um, and I've given it to him. He's put me back in Eskom to make a difference. And I believe that he will look after my safety and see that I do what I need to do. What was the final nail in the coffin for you? Given what you just said, that, that you felt it was a calling, that you could make a difference, but you made that call, whether it was your involvement in Mudupi, mm. Kusile. Mm. 
Bronwyn, in November 22, when Kyle Cohen couldn't keep his mouth, now he was 24 and he had to say, I'm going to go on pension. But he didn't say, you know, in Eskom, when you turn 65, you have to go on pension. So it became a big issue. And it also landed on the table of President Ramaphosa. So he invited me to his house one Sunday morning, um, in a couple of months after that, just before I left. And we had a long discussion, him and myself, for about two hours, just the two of us in his house. Um, and at the end, you know, after I'd spoken for quite some time, um, he said, Matt, Jan, I want you to stay. Uh, Did he not say, I want you to run? Yes. No. During the discussion, I made it clear I'm not interested. He did ask me who I believe uh, she's run Eskom, which I gave him my views. Um, I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, you cannot throw <laughs> us breadcrumbs like that and not go any further. Who do you believe should run Eskom? Yeah, that someone that has... Let's come back to Andre de Reiter. And I'll answer your question by, by, by saying what I'm saying now. Andre de Reiter was, in my view, we were, became very good friends and, and business colleagues. So he was an exceptional businessman, make no mistake. Um, the shortcoming he had, he was a lawyer. I'm not saying lawyers are shortcoming, but <laughs> from a technical point of view, he had some challenges, um, although he did fairly well in my view. I believe he started getting a team together that if we were left alone to do what we believed was what we had to do, I believe we would have moved positively forward. So wherever you put in there, and you know Dan Morocane that started now, uh, I don't know him from a bar of soap. In the 10 years that I left Lisbon, between my first and second live in Eskom, he was there, so I, I don't know him. But I wish him, really, I wish him well. But I just trust that he will be supported and not dictated to what to do. So Mtetu Nyati is sitting as chairman. Mm -hmm. Do you know Mtetu? I've met him when he was appointed, uh, you know, in the last board meeting, yes. They're going to have to work very closely together, aren't they? Absolutely. Um, I have respect for uh, Mtetu. Um, but... I can recall when the new board was appointed, you know, they had their own views, which I respect. And it was, let's quickly fix this. It is now what, going for two years. It is not an easy situation. It's a very complex business. It's a, it's a business that 20, 22 years ago, when it was voted by its peers in the world as the best utility in the world, to get back to that, I believe, is not possible for various reasons. So I just trust that sanity will prevail because in my view, the Eskom of the past is gone. As a matter of fact, when I was reappointed in Eskom uh, in July 18, after two, three months, the board asked me at the time to come back and say, can we fix Eskom? And I started off by saying, you know, what you told me and what I've experienced is, is chalk and cheese. And I said to him, you cannot fix ESCOM. You've got to split it. You've got to cut it apart. Um, and Andre came in and, and he, he did quite well. Um, it was my view that you have to take the generation, transmission, and distribution and make it separate unit, uh, uh, units, each one you know, with its own focus. Because when I arrived back, ESCOM was a black hole. Um, you know, finances, procurement, everything. Nobody was accountable. I see, I've, or actually I heard now that this uh, VGBSE uh, report now is actually highlighting that as well, which was true. What a power station manager did, nobody knows when I arrived. To give you an example, I arrived back, and my induction back in my second life in Eskom was, Pakomani Khadebe is going overseas to go and get money, and I'm acting. A week after I rejoined that, eh? 10 years ago. Industrial action and load shedding. So that was my induction back in ESCO. So the, the, the issues, 
what came to my table in that first two, three weeks, just to demonstrate that there was no accountability at a power station level for the power station manager, I got the feedback that at one of the power stations, the people were just running in and out. Security systems didn't work. The turnstile didn't work. I picked up the phone. I phoned the power station managers. Why is it not working? No. First, I said, what is happening? He said, the turnstile is not working. I said, I know. That's why I'm phoning you. I said, why is it not working? He said, sir, please talk to security at Megawatt Park. Another occasion, no fuel oil. No fuel oil is like blitz. So you, 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 at the power station, you take coal, you, you grind it, you make, the, uh, make it a powder, and then you have you know, fuel oil like blitz, and you get it going. You heat up the pipes and the water in the boiler. No fuel oil. What? I phone the power station. I said, Why have you no fuel oil? He said, sir, please phone procurement at Megawatt Park. So this is what I found going back. So these deep, deep operational inefficiencies. Absolutely. But it was planned. Make no mistake, it was planned that they could loot. That's what it was all about. So we've, we've built this session as the timeline it will take to fix Eskom, the capital it will take to fix Eskom. I know from boardrooms in South Africa, everybody is latching on to what you are saying in terms of the generation, transmission and the distribution and breaking up the organization. Is this what is actually going to happen? I want to talk into, I want to go into solution mode here. Sure. It depends on, on the shareholder. The owner of the business. The owner of the business appoints a board, please manage this company on my behalf. Board then appoints management, please, we're not there daily, please manage uh, on a daily basis. But the strings are still pulled by the owner of the business, obviously with, with inputs. Now, my view is, yes, uh, we need to move towards getting separate legal entities as soon as possible. And I believe what is important to understand is that generation, ESCOM generation, the generation of the past will not be the generation of the future. It will be one of the generating companies in the future. It will only be one of them. And it's one of my failures uh, in my tenure and I really feel bad about it. I, 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 I thought about it a long time, you know, how could I have done it differently? But I couldn't get it into a power station manager's head that you're actually running a massive business. Your input cost is there. If you do anything or nothing, it is there. You've got to pay people. You've got to go pay fuel, et cetera, et cetera. And if your unit is not producing, there's no flipping money coming in. And if there's no money incoming, you're running a loss. I couldn't get it over that you're actually running a business. So I believe this is a way we should be going in South Africa as soon as possible. And, and this is why I've decided to, to make a positive contribution uh, as best as I can, still within the South Africa energy sector, by generating additional electrons and to contribute positively to the lives of the 61 million people of the country. So I believe that the transmission company will remain as is for the time being. That's the way I see it. Because they need to understand what is the supply after demand, number one, and where is the supply going to come from. So I think that is, that is fine. You know, that used to, uh, it needs to be a, a single unit. But it needs to be run by professionals and a professional board. And then, as I said, generation, in my view... In when you time, say it needs to be run by professionals and a professional board, are you inferring that the current structures are not going to yield the appropriate results? I believe we need to, to relook really what we are doing and how we're doing it. We also need to make sure that we have competent and skilled people that uh, will take us forward. Um, we have started on the process and the shoulder, which was uh, Minister Gordon at the time, um, supported the fact that we become three legal entities with three separate legal bo uh, uh, independent boards. So I believe we've started the transition. I just believe that we need to continue doing so. Timelines. 
So uh, how long is the piece of string? Eh? It is a difficult question. You know, I was listening to Ian Cameron just now um, before lunch, and he was talking about purpose and talk about hope. Um, I believe that the lack of policy in the sector has put us on the back foot. So we are reacting on whatever is happening. It's a reaction from, from whatever needs to happen. And I believe that policy needs to take a significant focus that we get on the front foot and that we don't react to things that is actually costing us an arm and a leg. So to answer your question is a difficult one, Bronwyn, how long is it going to take? It is definitely not going to take building a nuclear power station. I've heard this on the news and I couldn't believe what I'm getting. We're going to build a nuclear power station that's going to get us out of load shedding. I don't know you heard it as well. Now, I don't think we've got 10 years to wait because that's how long it takes to build a power station, a nuclear power station. So I believe we just need to understand what the demand in the country is and the profile. So it's one thing to say this, and we, we need 10 gigawatts more, whatever the case may be. It's also to understand what is the profile that is required. We also need to understand what is the technology that is coming, what is, how is that going to change you know, uh, the, the demand and, and the profile. And only when you have a good understanding of that, then to go back and say, what do we need? So if you ask me, it is going to take some more time. And I don't want to interrupt you there. Okay, and this is why I believe, Bronwyn, that we need urgently to look at a regional solution beyond the borders of South Africa as well. Um, if you look what is happening in Europe, you know, those countries are all connected. So, and I believe that's where we need to go. We, because we have a South African power pool, a, a transmission system that is integrated uh, to some extent, a, a lot of work needs to happen. But this will help if we have a regional view that um, we will also then be able as a region to assist ourselves in whichever country to deal with the energy security challenge that we have. Do we have the leadership within the region to make this work any more than we have the dearth of leadership to make it work within our own economy? I've been approached by, and I'm not going to tell you which, which country it is, I've been approached by a country asking me to to, to come and assist um, because they are fully cognizant of the fact that the lack of energy security is costing the country an arm and a leg. I've also been approached to assist by looking at the Sambesi. You know, that water is running all the time. So why don't we utilize it by means of pump storage, by means of uh, hydro? So I believe it's not Zambia. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, but so, and, and, and I unfortunately believe it's going to take time, you know. And also, although I am assisting now in a renewable um, company, is that the solution? No, it's not the only solution. And this is why I cannot emphasize enough this demand picture to understand it. Because it doesn't mean sun and wind alone. You need a hybrid solution to deal with the challenges that you have and to ensure that that demand and the profile that you need is addressed. I am amazed that we haven't moved forward with pump storage in the country, with gas in the country. Those are the things that we need because it's part of a hybrid solution to make sure that your demand, this profile, what you need, is effectively addressed. I want to open to audience questions. So, great. Hands up. Fantastic. We'll get the mic there. As we, we get the mic to, to the first gentleman, just in terms of 
South Africa's solution. You've tabled it. Pete Fulhoun yesterday on the stage was part of the opportunity from an investment thesis perspective in the country is that public sector is not working and private sector is coming in and filling the gap. Most boardrooms, and you take something like uh, the hospital group, Netcare, they've come in and provisioning their own energy resources. We're seeing Discovery do the same. Many of the private sector players are coming forward and saying, we're not waiting for the public sector to solve this. I mean, it could actually be that Eskom becomes irrelevant in the overall ecosystem. Not irrelevant, it'll always be there, but the private sector will prevail and that will make the transformation that we need. Uh, Bruno, no, I, to come back to what I said earlier, I agree with that. Um, Eskom will definitely not be irrelevant in time to come. They will have their role to play um, and, and they have a significant role to play. Um, they have... What we need to understand in the next 15 years, Max, 20 gigawatts, half of the generation capacity that is generated by means of burning coal will come to end of life. And that is base load capacity 365, 27, 24, 7. And this is why I'm talking about a hybrid solution. So, but there will at least be six of these massive big power stations uh, remain. Madupi and Kusili up until 2050. So they will still play a significant role. But this is why I say they will be one of the generation companies in future and private. It's the hybrid that I you're talking to. So. Yeah, you, you've just been touching on my question. So I read an article recently, I don't know about the exact details, but South Africa's got a capacity of plus minus 55 gigawatts, of which about 44 is... Eskom and the rest is private. Um, in 2022, I think two and a half gigawatts of um, renewable energy projects was approved. In 23, it was nearly six gigawatts. Um, I know it's complicated to get it into the grid, but is that not if they've that if, if that trajectory continues? Is that not part of the solution? It that, will it, it will be part of the solution, not in the solution. Um, over the last 18 months, 19, 20 months, let's make it over the last 20 months, we doubled, more than doubled the PV on the rooftops. The last year alone, 2,002 gigawatts alone. But the challenge that we have moving forward is for the system operator to ensure the integrity of the network going forward. Because all of a sudden you bring energy and you take capacity away. And it's to fully understand because your network always have been designed for base load capacity. So it's something else that we're bringing in. And then also another challenge that we have, although these bit windows are now getting momentum, flipping so late. You know, you know I'll, I'll come back to this now. So there's another significant challenge that we have in the country over and above generating electrons. It is to those electrons that we're generating, how do we get it to the load centers? Because all of a sudden now, where's the sun shining? Where's the wind blowing? It's where we don't have transmission infrastructure. This is why you find now, and we are dealing with that where I am now, we are ready. We've got the, 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 the investment, so we're ready to move forward and, and, and build the power plant. But there's grit capacity constraints on the Eskom side. So that's another challenge that we have. You know, and, and, and the point that I wanted to make, and let's make, let me make it, it, on the 9th of December 2019, the first time we had stage 6 load shedding in the country, I'll never forget it. Um, two days later, I had to look the president, the deputy president, the Minister of DMRE and DP and, 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 and ICE, and I had to tell them that this, what was happening. And the president, and that's when I started using the example of a car, so the deputy president afterwards said to me, so Jan, what are you telling us? We need a lot more new cars. And I said to him, spot on. Because you must remember, if you have a system that is so unreliable and so unpredictable, and it's not enough. 
How do you take those units off and maintain and, and fix them for two, three, four, five months, whatever is required, while you need it? So you need additional new cars. And there I said, the president then said, yeah, now how do we make sure it doesn't happen again? And I said to him, Mr. President, and, and he, these were my words. You can go and have, look it up. I said, Mr. President, we urgently need four to 6,000 megawatts of capacity. The day before yesterday, those are my words, more than four years ago. I said, even not, stage six will be part of our lives going forward. Now, the question that you ask is, the policymaker was sitting there and the implementer was sitting. Mm -hmm. So why is it taking so long? So it's, it, it's, it's really challenging. So that's why I say we are reactive. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jan, thank you uh, for your insights and uh, for the work you've done in the past. Um, you've sp st spoken a lot about structural issues. What, what about the actual culture at ESCOM? It seems like it's a culture of mediocrity and non-accountability. How do you actually change that? Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Uh, we've got exceptional people working within ESCOM. Make no mistake. Um, if you ask me today, what do I miss from my days in ESCOM? It's a people. Incredible, exceptional people. However, how do you get 20 years of experience? It's simple. You've got to work for 20 years. And you need a coach and you need a mentor. Simple. And by, remember what I said earlier, voluntary separation packages, this is what I got when I arrived. So let's just get rid of all the flipping experience and competence that we can get the numbers sorted out. Without understanding, Eskom is a complex business. So you let go the, 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 the mentors and the coaches and the experience, and you bring in young people with all the talent, all the potential in the world. But don't you set them the, on the back foot immediately. So I believe that we have a significant, and this is Jan's view, human capital challenge within the organization. And it's going to take time to get those wonderful colleagues. And I'm telling you, they've got all the potential and just all the talent in the world to get them to a level that they can take accountability and understand what they do. You know, why did the good Lord, you know, let us be born as babies and then you crawl and then you walk and then it's a process. To work is exactly the same process, in my view. So there is a moral challenge. Um, and, 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 you know, there was a time I can remember in my first life in Eskom when you walked in public and you had an Eskom badge and, geez, you were proud. Everybody was talking about. Now you don't even put a blazer on like that anymore. And, and this is why whenever I go around, even now, I'm asking people, don't crucify Eskom. Eskom's got their own problems, their own challenges. Make no mistake. But a lot of the decisions made in the past and perhaps still, in a, in a way, being made, getting Eskom where it is now, not about the good people there. They're trying their utmost. But yes, I believe that Eskom has a, 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 a role challenge. Go ahead, sir. Can I ask you a question now, but I only want you to finish it right, answer it right at the end. And that shows I've got the microphone in my hand. Rabbi Hopper has said this week that by the elections, his position as a minister will be redundant. Fact or fiction? I read it as well. <laughs> Ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, why would Eskom take Frankfurt to court for trying to get power, essentially? Why? Why? It doesn't make sense to the average man in the street. Yeah, um, it, it's something that I cannot comment on. Um, I believe perhaps, and I'm just trying an answer, and it's only my personal view without understanding the reasons. It may be because it, when you work for Eskom, you think about Eskom. You perhaps not think about the bigger picture. Um, I've been pushing now for the last 
two years, even the last year that I was in Eskom, <coughs> you ask me a question I haven't answered you. Why did what was why what was enough um, that we need to that, build? That's not a very good signal. <coughs> yeah, you said that now. It's very no, it's fine. <coughs> My wife will tell you. Um, the issue of having Eskom in a good year built 300 kilometers of transmission line. 300. We've got to build 14,000 in the next 12 years. Now, I'm saying, please, let's change the model that Eskom has been building these lines all along. You cannot do uh, 1,200, 1,400 kilometers. You cannot do it. So open it up to the market. Change it. Make, like a concession. You know, tell, tell whoever wants to participate with a bag of money, that's the way we want this line. We will look how you're going to build it. We will have all the necessary controls. You can own it. You can maintain it. But we will operate it. And in 20 years, you know, monthly, we will pay you this and you can get it back. I cannot get Eskom to understand this. And that's the point that I want to make. They think... I believe I'm Eskom and we can do it and perhaps not seeing the big picture. My brother farms on the Fisher River irrigation scheme. They're having a terrible trouble with unpredictable load shedding and their center pivots. About 10 kilometers away, the Fisher River tunnel comes into a, a portal with a generating chamber bigger than this room with one generator in place and all the mountings for another one. It's never, ever been switched on in 50 years. Does ESCOM know about it? And what's the chances of something happening there? It's been ready to go for 50 years. In my years with ESCOM, the last five years, I was not aware of it. In the Fisher River, I was not. I was aware of four of them, small little hydros in, in the former Transkei. But no, I was not, not aware of this. Yeah, I was not aware of this. If you want to, you can give me the information and I'll make sure. Yeah, please do. Go ahead, David. And um, another mic there, Steve. Jan, Medipi and Kasile really should be doing the, the heavy lifting for us right now. And I know in your channel there, there were design issues that you were going through units one at a time to try and sort out the design issues and get them up to speed. I mean, these are two incredibly important projects for us right now. They should be doing the heavy lifting and they need to be doing the heavy lifting for the next 20 years. When you left there, did you sort out the, hey, had you, got to the bottom of the design issues and will those units continue to deliver close to design c capacity on a, on a sustainable basis? Did we, did we solve those design issues? I believe that we have solved the design issues. If you look at specifically Medupi, um, so we have installed all the design modifications on all six units. We've also done it at Kusile. Now, if you look at the performance, with the exception of Unit 1 when we blew up that uh, generator, um, and again, that was because of inexperience. Um, so, but if you look at the, the five units at Medupi, they are performing exceptionally well. The energy availability is in the 80%, so it's going well. At, but there's no fluidized des gas desulfurization unit taking the sulfur out of the air. But it has to be installed. That's a World Bank requirement. If you look at Kusile, there you have this uh, plant uh, installed. And that is what created a significant amount of the challenges within Kusile. This is why we had that duct failure in units number one, two, and three, where we couldn't use that uh, smokestack anymore. We had to build three new temporary stacks. Um, if you look at unit number four, we've actually asked the regional uh, equipment supplier, you run it for a period of six to eight months. The energy availability was 80%. comes back to the point, I believe that ESCOM needs to invest in the most important asset of the organization. It's people much more. So those units, in my view, sorting out this, uh, the FGD operation, if we can do that, and we got to impl implement it at Medupi, those two big units, which is nearly 5,000 megawatts apiece, will perform extremely well. But I believe it depends on who's going to operate and maintain it. Excellent plot. Excellent plots. Right, Jan. Um, your view on Aguedi's 20 billion love affair with the top, 
car power ships. Um, is that another arms deal? And does ESCOM have to be on its knees before you can get it signed? The president asked me the same question. And I'll give you the same answer. My view is where the, where the country finds itself now, we need to look at it. There's no doubt about it. It's much cheaper, even though it's hell of expensive, than load shedding that we have in the country and what it's doing to, to, to the lives of the people. However, what I said, please, let's not sign 20-year deals. Let's sign a three- or five-year deal and let's have some understanding on what we're going to pay for the input, which is the gas. So I believe that is definitely something that we need to look at to get through the challenge that we have. However, if you do that, let's at least have plans. What do we do in the meantime? I did wait. Well. Uh, Go ahead. Jan, um, with regards to um, wheeling, and specifically um, if you consider the fact that um, private generation is probably a key part of the solution going forward, mm -hmm. and then using ESCOM's transmission capability to get it to, to clients elsewhere. Mm -hmm. We all know that wheeling takes place on the ESCOM to ESCOM level, um, where clients are on the ESCOM network instead of municipal level. The challenges that we face on municipal level um, to get wheeling properly working in the country, how do you see that play out and getting fixed? First of all, we need to make sure that we have uh, sufficient uh, electrical networks in place. That is critical. And if we have that in place, our policymaker needs to start getting, in my view, perhaps not the act together. There's perhaps a more positive way of saying it, but let me leave it there. And getting these tariffs implemented, that if we will, and if there's sufficient capacity on that network, what are you going to pay for that? So I believe traders and wheeling is something of the future coming in. So it, it may be where Eskom will buy directly or they will generate themselves and, and get the power wherever they want to. They wheel it through their own, own electrical networks. Or number two, they will buy it from an IPP and then get it to their, um, to their, uh, their, their customers. Another option is an IPP will then go directly to a customer but in order to do that and not having access to its own network, electrical network, they will have to wheel it by ESCOM, provided there's sufficient capacity, or you can have a trader that is in between. So it is something that needs to take place going forward. And I believe that not a lot of attention, my view, is given on this currently, and it has to. Because this is something that's come to stay. Trading of electricity is coming. It's, it's perhaps not yet yet, but it's coming. There's no doubt. And, 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 and the, the wheeling of electricity on whatever network is, is available is a given. But the challenge that we in, in South Africa have, we do not have it, it's sufficient electrical networks throughout the country. And to, to get the power generated wherever in South Africa to the load centers where it's needed. I'm, I'm sure some of you do have some farms. If there is Kambaki stops there. Now, think about this. Now, you and the wife or you and the husband are sitting there every night having a glass of coffee, whatever. <laughs> and you look at the beautiful sunset or sunrise, whatever you want to call it. And, and it's just picture perfect and life is perfect. The next day, there is Kambaki stops there. It's a madam. Will you please sign here? We want to build a transmission line. All right. Are you going to sign? I don't think so. so there are some significant challenges. So, yeah. Man, yeah. Uh, very insightful uh, discussion you've had here. My big takeaway so far, and I'm talking from engineer to engineer, um, you've got a, Eskim's got a cultural problem, no doubt. And, uh, and I always think of the Jim Collins book from good to great. Uh, and Eskim was one of the greatest utilities in the world. Now it's gone from great to, I don't know, let's say poor. Is it not the remuneration policies that were actually put in a few decades ago where there was a maximization of, uh, of return on assets? In other words, trying to turn it into a profit-generating entity. Because I, you know, also running businesses, you've always got a balance between investing in capex and, and your maintenance. 
And the thing that came through to me now is you, there wasn't any money or not much money spent on maintenance all these years. And you, it's, it's, you can never fix it unless you start replacing the plant. So was that not the start of the rot that came into Eskim? The lack of, well, the, the actual, the KRAs was to maximize profit as opposed to maximize the longevity of the equipment. Just a question. I believe it may have been one of the contributing factors, uh, absolutely. I want to come back to, to the people. Um, Eskom has got, and I'll never stop saying it, it's got some exceptional people. I believe that Eskom, what they're doing extremely well is they remunerating people extremely well. Um, yeah, there has been some challenges, uh, especially for the, the leadership in terms of... Uh, annual increases, etc. But I believe in general, Eskom is, is paying its people extremely well. Some decisions were made in the past that the country is paying dearly for. There is no doubt about it. And, and I don't believe that some of the decisions made in the past was perhaps focusing on to improve the lives of 61 million people in the country, but maybe some other agendas that I'm not aware of. There are people making uh, decisions in ESCOM that I believe is looking after the well-being of uh, the economy in the country, but I don't believe it's always there. Yes, go ahead. I know you've been... Jan, thank you. Um, you've spoken a lot about the complexity, the technical, the maintenance, and uh, I read a lot into what's been said, the lack of fit for purpose. But in the end, there's also a big funding gap. And we have a culture, not only in Eskom, as to the exorbitant um, procurement and corrupt process heard and read about, but our South African consumer that... Uh, is entitling themselves to using Eskom generated power and not paying therefore. Um, what is the view of the Eskom executive of the board policy that this cannot continue? We've got municipalities that own oh, Eskom billions and billions of rands, and yet we paying consumers are faced with the annual call for increase in tariff, mm. and yet there is this big lack of um, policy making or I don't want to call it a big stick, but certainly this, this can't continue. Sure. If you have a business and you owe people 400 billion rand, then you have significant challenges. There is no doubt about it. And then with your sometimes limping generation plant, you still produce electrons and through your network and you you provide it to customers and some of them don't pay for it, then it becomes challenging. So all of a sudden your cash flow is, is, is becoming a significant challenge. Um, there are five big issues in ESCOM, in my view. The one, human capital we've spoken about. The second one is finance, exactly what you're talking about. Um, because we still need to pump to get the economy to pump. So we need to assess ESCOM wherever we can. So it's a difficult one. The third one being asset management. And with asset management, I mean all assets. Then the fourth one is additional um, capacity. And the fifth one being the criminality and corruption. I believe those are the five big issues. Now to come back to the finance one, I was vocal, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to give it again in general, and I'm not going to answer anything. <coughs> no. But I said, is it possible for government perhaps to take away Eskom's financial obligations, annual financial obligations? And um, because Eskom's making a 30 billion rand EBITDA operating profit. So at least then there's money that you can take the money and you can maintain your plant. And plant mean not only generation, but all your plant, transmission and distribution as well. 
Now, fortunately, last year, the um, the Minister of Finance then came forward and he said, Eskom, I'm going to take away your financial obligations, if you can recall, for three years, 240, 50, 60 billion. I don't know what it is. Because it's no use. You make a 30 billion profit, and as soon as you need to pay everybody that you owe money, you make a 30 billion loss. Um, but the Minister of Finance made it very clear. However, if I do this, you will not borrow another cent. So it was my understanding now, Eskom has 30 billion that they will invest. But now I see they burn it everything on diesel. Some of you will be happy. But now, if you look, I, I would venture that Eskom's bowl, oh no, let me put it, the bowl for running open cycle gas turbines this year is going to be at least 36 billion rand. So the money that was available is perhaps now utilized for something else. And then you need to ask the question, so why are we burning diesel? Why don't we convert to gas? I owe you an answer. Jan, I'm going to take a final question from this gentleman, then we will close with your question. Well, partially close, and then we will close with my question. We'll uh, Jan, I'm going to go back to um, something you said earlier on that you see the solution um, looking at a regional, but we know Rokana is going through a drought, so they don't. We know Mozambique, the contract's coming to an end, so they want their power back. Um, that doesn't leave you with much, much more leeway in terms of the South African vis a -vis regional. So doesn't that sort of take the feet out from your possible solution. Those, I agree with you. <laughs> However, the whole of Sambesi is running there. So I believe there's a, a potential that we need to benefit from. There's gas in Mozambique, second to none. So it is not to get the gas here, but why don't we get transmission lines that have come here or connected to a South African power pool? So I believe they are, and, 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 and the Congo has a lot of water. So yes, there are isolated um, areas that perhaps is not going to have a positive contribution. But I believe there are so many others that we haven't sort of given the attention and the focus in the region that we actually can. And I believe that people with the experience need perhaps to stick up their hands and say... Um, I'm prepared to make a contribution. I think you need to remind us of your question. No, I know it. You know it. Ramaphopa. <laughs> um, I read it as well, where Minister of Electricity said um, he believes by the end of the year you'll be out without a job because then load shedding will be something of the past. That's what I read. And you know what I, or what I read and what somebody's actually said, you know, there is always something there. So, um, because, you know, Wendy, my wife, she's, she's, she's looking at news and stuff on social media. I don't. Um, and the thing is that people are saying what I've said and et cetera, you know, it's chalk and cheese sometimes. But should that be true? And load shedding is a thing of the past, which I respectfully cannot see. Respectfully, I cannot see that. But should it be true, then I'll take my hat off to the Minister of Electricity if he's saying, I'm standing back, I've done my job. And my final question? Why did I leave? I thought you were going to ask it again. After the meeting, or during the meeting, at the end of the meeting with the President, um, it's difficult to say no you know, all the time to him. Um, but I was, when he said to me, please, I'd like you to stay, because two days before it, he sent his advisor, and I said no. So I, he said, I'd like you to stay, and I said no. And I gave him five minutes, why, why it's time for me to go. And 
when I was done, he was just looking at me and he said, you don't. I said, yes, uh, Mr. President. And he said, I would like you to stay. <laughs> so I then agreed, okay, I'll stay, but not as group operating officer, chief operating officer. I will focus on Kusile, you know, where we had the chimney challenges, and then I'll focus on Kuburg. And that's exactly what I then did uh, after I retired formally. But this was in the three, it was three months, three months after, in May, June, July. No, two and a half months. May, June, and the middle of July, up until I said, no, nah, enough. There were four additional forensic investigations against me. None with any substance. You know, the one I'm sure you've read was Fidelity Guards. Remember the half a billion thing? Uh, rubbish. Um, everything has been signed, approved at board levels. So, and it wasn't half a billion, it was 280 million. <laughs> Then there was two others, but the one that was that broke the camel's back was, you know, I got a an email from wherever saying in ESCOM, we just inform you there will be another forensic investigation against you for you approving um, a company that will investigate corruption. They want to investigate me forensically because I have appointed somebody to investigate in May 2018 while I only joined in July 2018. So then I said I had enough. I had enough. Let me rather than try my utmost to... You know what I haven't told you? Uh, what is my purpose in life? Do I have a minute? You do. Indeed. It took me, Bronwyn, as a young man, it took me, I, I didn't understand why did the good Lord put me here, you know, what is my purpose in life? And as I said earlier, I was very blessed to have heading, headed up uh, electrification in the mid-90s. And I can remember we were sitting one, it was either a Friday afternoon or Saturday, I can't remember. It's late afternoon, we've electrified a village. It was in the beginning of electrification. And they're close to Grobersdal, Christian, you know, Grobersdal, Marble, somewhere around there. And this chief, we said to him, you talk. When it gets dark, you know, then you stop, and then we're going to switch on the lights. Just, and this guy was just getting on and on and on and on. And eventually, you know, we caught his eye and piped down. So he piped down, and we had a, a little breaker here on, mounted on a little pedestal, and he put on this breaker. And when he put on the breaker, we showed, put on the links here at the back. And all of a sudden, it was just lights. And, you know, the uncles and the aunts and the children... Everybody was shouting and screaming and laughing and crying. And, and I was just sitting there becoming extremely emotional. And I still do thinking about it. And just here I realized what is my purpose in life. And that is to make a positive contribution in the lives of others. And this is why I still carry on. And I'm very blessed. Um, you know, the good Lord is looking well after us. Uh, you know, my health is okay. And I believe... At this stage of my life, I can, what I have learned, what I've been so blessed in doing and learning by working to plow back in the region and, and to see if I can make a contribution. And I'm sure you will continue to make a contribution. It's been a privilege. And Oberholzer, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Bronwyn.